guess what these are? Toys? Not really. Believe it or not, these are actually the earliest microscopes. The word microscope was officially introduced in the year 1625, but the object that used the concept of microscopy had already been created in the year 1590 by a father and son team of Hans and Zacharias Janssen. The interesting thing is that the both of them were not scientists. They were spectacle makers. So the initial microscope was sort of an expensive toy. It was only in the year 1673 that a scientist by the name of Anton van Leeuwenhoek decided to use the concept of microscopy to look at microscopic organisms. This is BioWorld giving you some background story on microscopes. But now let's move on to the syllabus. Here you are going to learn the basic principles of light and electron microscopy. Now this was Anton von Leeuwenhoek's simple light microscope. Of course, today's microscopes look nothing like this. Microscopes you'll find in your lab looks like this. However, microscope technology has not stopped at light microscopes. In fact, in the year 1931, a new technology was developed, which involved electron microscopes. You will not find this in your science lab. You can only find electron microscopes in research centers. The electron microscope was created by two Germans. One was an electrical engineer and the other a physicist. The physicist earned himself a Nobel Prize for his design of the electron microscope. You may wonder why Max Nall was not also awarded the Nobel Prize. Maybe you could Google and find out. Now we continue with our syllabus that is light microscopes. Let us now identify parts of the light microscope, starting with the light source. In this microscope, the light source is an electrical bulb. So if you are going to use this type of a microscope, you must be connected to an electric supply. However, there are light microscopes that use sunlight as its light source. Those microscopes are independent of electricity, but must be placed at a location where sunlight is available. In those microscopes, the light bulb will be replaced with a mirror. So the mirror will reflect the sunlight to the condenser. The condenser has an opening that can direct the light to the stage. It is on the stage that we will place our slide with the specimen on it for observation. We will rotate the objective lens to get the magnification that we want. Most of the time, light microscopes will have three objective lengths. The shorter the objective lens, the smaller the magnification. To view the specimen, we will place our eyes here at the eyepiece lens. The eyepiece lens itself will have magnification too. Now, if we view something that appears blurry like this, then we can rotate the dial here to get better focus. However, at times, Due to the limitation of the microscope, the image may not get clearer. The ability to see a clear image through a microscope depends on the resolving power of the microscope. Resolving power refers to the minimum distance between two points which can still be distinguished as two separate points. Let me use this as an example. Let's say these two spheres represent two cells as seen under the microscope. And let's say these two cells are at a distance of 0.5 millimeters. 
Now let me introduce two microscopes, microscope A and microscope B, with different resolving powers. Now when viewing an object with a minimum distance of 0.5 millimeters, let's say this is the image that was obtained. We can see that both microscope A and microscope B gave clear images. Now let's bring the spheres closer together. Let's say now the distance is only 0.25 millimeters. Let's see what the images from both microscope A and B look like. Here you can see the image in microscope A has started to become blur, whereas image in microscope B is still very clear. So from here we can see whichever microscope still able to give us a clear image, although the minimum distance is getting smaller, then that microscope has a greater resolving power. So the resolving power actually is a measurement of the clarity of image, meaning that the higher the resolving power, the clearer the image. Don't panic on seeing this formula. Biology doesn't require you to memorize this formula, but I'm going to use this formula to help solve one question. Now, how do we improve the resolving power of the microscope so as to get a clearer image? From the formula, you can see that the resolving power is inversely related to the wavelength of light used. So, that means if we want to improve resolving power, we have to use wavelengths of lights that are small. Let's have a look at the spectrum of light. Visible light is between 700 nanometers to 400 nanometers. So if we are going to place a filter on our white light, red filter would not be suitable since it has a longer wavelength. Blue filter will be very suitable because it will lead to a shorter wavelength, which will mean higher resolving powers. This was the concept behind the use of electron microscopes, which I will discuss later. Now, let me explain briefly how the light microscope functions. First, light either internally from the light bulb or externally from the sunlight will pass through the condenser and focus on the specimen that is placed on the stage. The light then touches the objective lens where the objective lens will magnify the image and pass the light on to the eyepiece lens. When we look into the eyepiece lens, Whatever we see is interpreted into an image by our eye. For example, this is the image of flower pollen as seen through a light microscope. Later, I will show you what the flower pollen looks like under an electron microscope. So come, let's move on to discuss about the electron microscope. There are actually two types of electron microscopes that we will talk about. We'll start first with the transmission electron microscope. This microscope has an electron gun at the top. This electron gun will emit electrons at high speed. Below that, we have the anode. And throughout this column here, we have magnetic condenser lenses. This circle here is where we will insert the specimen that we want to observe. And right at the bottom here is what we call the viewing screen. So the researcher can look into this viewing screen. But the actual image of the specimen will be displayed here on the computer screen. Let me now discuss the brief mechanism by which transmission electron microscopes work. Once the electron microscope is switched on, the electron gun will generate an electron beam 
In this beam, the electrons will be traveling at high speed. So that is why the column must remain a vacuum. This is to ensure that the electrons do not collide with the gas molecules and become diverted. To ensure that the electron beam travels directly to the specimen, this column will contain magnetic condenser lenses to help focus the beam. When preparing specimens for transmission electron microscopes, there are certain rules to be followed. The specimen must be cut extremely thin and coated with heavy metal. The purpose for this is so that the electrons can do either of these two. One, it can become absorbed by the heavy metal on the specimen or it can pass through the thinly cut part of the specimen. So the electrons that exit the specimen will be fewer than the electrons that were originally released. These electrons then travel down to the fluorescent plate located at the bottom. Whatever is recorded by the fluorescent plate will be displayed here on the screen. And we will get a two-dimensional image of the cut specimen. This is actually what the pollen looks like inside. So the transmission electron microscope is able to give us the internal view of a structure. You can see there are two different shades of color darker color and a lighter color. Wherever the color is dark, that is where the electrons had been absorbed by the specimen. And so those electrons did not reach the fluorescent plate. That's why it remains dark. Places which are lighter in color are places where the electrons passed through the specimen. So those electrons arrived at the fluorescent plate and caused the image to turn white. Now that we know what a transmission electron microscope is, let's move on to the scanning electron microscope. Appearance-wise, the scanning electron microscope looks similar. It has the electron gun, the anode, the magnetic condenser lens, the specimen chamber. But you can see there is no viewing display with the fluorescent plate. Instead, we have the secondary electron detector. But the computer screen is still here too. Now that we've identified the parts of the scanning electron microscope, let's look at how it functions. The scanning electron microscope in the early stages are similar to the transmission electron microscope. So when you switch it on, an electron gun will generate the electron beam. That electron beam will contain electrons traveling at high speed. So this column will be a vacuum also. Then you'll have the magnetic condenser lenses focusing the electron beam onto the specimen. Now, it is here at the specimen where the preparation is different. In scanning electron microscopes, you do not need to cut the specimen. Specimen can be thick, but you still have to coat it with heavy metal. So as a consequence of this, what happens is the electrons from the electron beam cannot pass through the specimen because it is too thick. But it will reflect or bounce off the heavy metal on the specimen. So every time the electron bounces off, the detector here will actually record the number of times the electrons are by being reflected. And based on that, the computer program will generate a 3D image. So this is what flower pollens look like. Although the same specimen has been used, 
but the images we get are different because of the different microscopes being used. So let's move on to discuss about the differences between each microscope. The images that we get from the light microscope and the transmission electron microscopes are two-dimensional, whereas the image for the scanning electron microscope is three-dimensional. The light microscope images is viewed using our own eye, but the images of the transmission electron microscope and the scanning electron microscope make use of computer softwares where the computer will produce an electron microgram. Besides the difference in the images produced, even the preparation of the specimen is different between the light microscopes and the electron microscopes. For instance, in the light microscope, the specimen can be either dead or alive, but in the electron microscopes, the specimen must be dead. This is because the electron microscopes use vacuum chambers to make sure that the electrons move without obstruction. Another factor about specimens is that in light microscopes, the specimens have to be cut thin. This is so that the light can pass through the specimen. For the transmission electron microscope, the specimen must also be thin. This time, it is to enable the electrons to pass through. However, the scanning electron microscopes can have thick specimens since the electrons just have to bounce off the surface of the specimen. The third difference between the specimen preparation in these microscopes is that in the light microscope, we can use dye to make the images more visible. This is done because cells are transparent. However, in the transmission electron microscopes, we use heavy metals so that it can absorb the electrons and give us a darker image. The scanning electron microscopes also need specimens with heavy metal, but this time it is to enable the electrons to bounce off. For example, here you see the B is coated with gold to enable scanning electron microscope images to be developed. Another aspect to compare between these two microscopes is their light source. Light microscopes use white light with tungsten filaments where these lights emit wavelengths between 400 to 700 nanometers. And as we know, if the wavelength is big, then the resolving power of the microscope will be low, minimum distance of about 2 micrometers only. And the maximum magnification that a light microscope can give is about 1,000 times. If we compare this to electron microscopes, where the light source is actually the electron gun that emits electrons, with a wavelength of only 0 0.0005 nanometers, you can imagine naturally the resolving power is going to be extremely high where the minimum distance can be as little as 5 nanometers. Magnification also can be as much as 500,000 times in the transmission electron microscopes and 100,000 times in the scanning electron microscopes. In conclusion, we can say that light microscope has a number of advantages. Mainly the fact that it is cheaper than the electron microscope. And for school use, it is very easy to carry around. But it has its disadvantages. It has low resolving power, which we can overcome by using blue filter, UV lights, or even a droplet of oil. It has low contrast, but we can also overcome this by using colored dyes to make the cells visible to the eye. However, we cannot deny the low magnification limits the amount of knowledge we can acquire through the light microscope and the incidence of artifacts.
For example, this blue line that you see here is an artifact. For an amateur, you may assume you are seeing a new microorganism, when in fact, it is just a fiber from the wiping of the slide. If we compare with the electron microscope, the advantages of the electron microscope are many. It has very high resolving power, very high magnification, Scanning electron microscopes can give us 3D images and we can also use thick specimens. And lately, electron microscopes are also able to generate colorful images. But the disadvantage is, of course, it's terribly expensive, going into millions. And to take care of these microscopes, you must place them in rooms that have a constant temperature and you must maintain the vacuum condition in these microscopes. So with that, I conclude today's video. Bye-bye.